Hello everyone and welcome to session six of the ISJL virtual vacation. I'm Nora Katz. I'm the ISJL's Director of Heritage and Interpretation. Right now, the virtual vacation is focused on the history of the civil rights movement and the ways in which Jews responded to and participated in the movement. It's a complicated story, as we've seen, and it's a story that is far from over. I want to introduce you to the concept of the long civil rights movement. This is an idea proposed by historian Jacqueline Dowd Hall that has now come to be widely accepted by historians of the movement and of the black freedom struggle in general. In a nutshell, this is the idea that the civil rights movement begins long before we typically think it does. We often think of the movement beginning with activism following Brown versus Board of Education, the 1954 Supreme Court ruling that found segregation in public schools to be unconstitutional. The classical civil rights movement, as it's sometimes called, begins at this turning point. But many argue that civil rights organizing began in 1865 with emancipation, or at the latest in the 1930s with the New Deal and that moment of social and political change. This long civil rights movement idea also posits that the movement doesn't have a defined end. Too often we talk about the movement ending with the Voting Rights Act of 1965 or with the assassination of Dr. King in 1968. But in many ways, the movement for black civil rights and equal rights for all was just getting started. The 1970s and the 1980s were key moments in organizing for black civil rights, especially surrounding issues like housing insecurity, education access, and gerrymandering. I and many others argue that the civil rights movement is ongoing in the present. Jacqueline Dowd Hall, who gives us the term, the long civil rights movement, cautions us to avoid thinking about the movement as a thing of the past and encourages us to understand that the fight for equal rights is ongoing and will continue until all people are free. So it's in this intellectual tradition that I'm excited to bring you today's session of the ISGL virtual vacation. Something that I always try to emphasize for our Southern Jewish Heritage Tour groups is that the South, too often viewed as a place where equal justice is unattainable, is actually the beating heart of the ongoing movement for Black civil rights. Some of the most exciting, groundbreaking, and meaningful organizing for a more just future for our country is happening right here. So I want to celebrate and shine a light on that during today's session. I got the chance to chat with colleagues and friends of the ISJL who are doing different kinds of justice work in the South today. I'll introduce them to you as we meet them. First, I chatted with Rabbi Salem Pierce. Rabbi Pierce is the new executive director of Carolina Jews for Justice based in North Carolina. She served as an ISJL rabbinical intern while she was in rabbinical school, so it was wonderful to catch up with her and learn about her current work. Carolina Jews for Justice is a relatively young organization. Rabbi Pierce talked to me about fighting for food access and voting rights in North Carolina and explained how her work is deeply rooted in Jewish values. Um, hi, my name is Rabbi Salem Pierce. I am the executive director of Carolina Jews for Justice, which is a statewide organization in North Carolina. We have four chapters around the state and basically we try to mobilize the Jewish community to take action on issues of justice that affect of course, the Jewish community here in North Carolina, but the whole community in North Carolina, because we believe we have obligations um, as Jews, not only to ourselves to make this a more just world for ourselves, but a just world for um, our, our neighbors and friends as well. So Carolina Jews for Justice is a young organization. We started about seven years ago in uh, the living room of one of our long, you know, one of our now uh, Raleigh members. And um, it really came about from a real lack um, of opportunities for Jews to engage in justice work. We are the only statewide Jewish justice organization that exists in the South. Um, we're really proud of that um, in some ways. And also just, um, you know, know that um, Jews in the South have a, have a unique opportunity to play, I think, in, um, in issues of justice in this country. I lived for many years in D.C., in Boston, and in New York, and I love the Jewish communities that I was a part of. Um, and I think Jews are, um, can have more impact um, in places that are not so traditionally uh, progressive. One of the, the stories that our members like to tell is 
uh, really getting involved through Reverend uh, William Barber's Moral Mondays, which started here in North Carolina in Raleigh, um, as a way of highlighting um, the the values that um, that Reverend Barber and his Poor People's Campaign thought were lacking um, in prominent discourse uh, in um, in the North Carolinian um, state government. And um, what, what Reverend Barber was concerned about was that values like um, healthcare and care for the poor and um, you know, criminal justice reform weren't being addressed um, by, by the legislature. And for him, you know, those are the values that are ones that we should be focusing on, especially um, as people in religious communities or as sometimes said, people of faith. Um, and that he felt like a lot of other um, values were not the ones that, uh, that he felt were important ones for religious people to have. Um, and one of our members in, um, in the West tells a story about um, leaving uh, to go to a local event uh, around the Moral Mondays um, with her synagogue banner and being stopped and told, you can't take, you know, the synagogue can't be associated with that. Um, and, you know, like, I don't want to necessarily criticize a synagogue, um, but, you know, sometimes I think our institutions are more cautious uh, than um, they need to be, certainly, and, and should be. And um, what they realize is we need a place, a home for us to be able to do the justice work we want to do. And so um, North Car uh, Carolina Jews for Justice was formed. We do have, um, I would say, what are many um, Jewish core principles. Um, one of them um, is, um, I think, so often used, but I, I just don't, I can't overstate the importance of it, uh, which is uh, B'Tselem Elohim, which means the image of God, and the belief that every person is created in the image of God and therefore is accorded dignity. Um, and then when we don't um, treat people with dignity and with respect, we are in fact desecrating the divine image, um, which makes the stakes very high for how we treat human beings. And you know, the story that this value comes from is in the book of Genesis, and it's talking about the creation of all human beings not just Jews, um, not just the people that think like us, um, or not just the people who look like us, but everyone. Um, and I think that's a really important value um, to that we are trying to create a community and a society that works for all human beings. Um, I would say another um, principle is Vehata Lereecha Kamocha, which means love your neighbor as yourself. It is easy to um, display love or like or caring or compassion um, for, uh, for folks um, perhaps that are nearest to us. And I think what the Torah is asking us to do is to expand who our neighbor is um, and to realize that our actions have consequences even if we can't see them with us. So here in Durham, where I am, one of the things we've done is to partner with some local organizations, the Poor People's Campaign for one, and then another organization called Raise Up um, NC, Raise Up North Carolina, which works on um, getting the minimum wage up to $15 an hour. Um, and we have um, come together um, in these past few months, and we're now doing a political food distribution. Um, uh, project right now. And this is an acknowledgement that these are very hard times and the government has not stepped up, hasn't, you know, there's, there's been a crisis um, around poverty and food um, insecurity for a while now, but um, the pandemic has worsened that. And we haven't seen the appropriate response from our government. So these three nonprofit organizations got together, um, including us, to be able to distribute food every other month uh, for free, excuse me, every other week um, for free to anyone who wants it. And it's um, not just your typical food pantry in many ways. One of them is that it's all fresh produce, which I think is amazing from local farms. Um, 
And, you know, I mean, canned tuna has a place, but it is really nice to be able to, to give folks fresh, uh, fresh food. Um, and then we're combining this with um, opportunities for political education, um, for people uh, to understand like how we got here. We are the richest country in the world and North Carolina has all of the resources it needs um, to be able to feed its, um, its residents. We don't need to have people hungry um, in this state or in this country. Um, and that's a choice that we have made. Um, and um, also we invite everyone who um, comes and gets food to come back another time and distribute it with us. Everyone who distributes get a, gets a box. Um, you know, last time I did it, I got a box. I don't necessarily need it, but I think it's important, um, you know, to have this model of everyone um, gives away and everyone is able to get um, as well. And it's not just a matter of charity, but a matter of solidarity. Um, because we all are workers. Now, I happen to not, you know, make minimum wage. Um, I'm very, uh, I'm comfortable and, and I'm able to have a salary and benefits, which not all folks are. Um, but I still am, you know, a worker and I want to be in solidarity with those who are also, also working. And then the last part of this project is doing some canvassing to try to um, build power among these organizations, um, getting folks involved in, um, in other parts um, of the organizations. So that's one project we're doing. Um, another big one right now, obviously as uh, November 3rd looms, is um, trying to get um, folks involved in voting, um, such a crucial part of civic engagement in our democracy. Um, and so we've done some um, lobbying of uh, city councils and counties, whoever is setting um, up the voting apparatuses, you know, to make sure that we have plenty of early voting, we, ha we have all the sites that we need so people can access, um, because, you know, really getting, um, being able to access voting, you know, especially right now is a challenge. For many people. The fact is, you know, that fewer people vote than um, are eligible to, and, um, and that is a problem that needs to change. Anyone who believes in a democracy should want everyone to vote, um, and that's sort of the cornerstone um, on which our country is founded, although I guess that's not totally true because we, um, <laughs> we weren't originally that way. But the aspiration of our country, the clear aspiration of our country um, is equality under the law. And um, you know, not being able to vote um, it, you know, for whatever reason is a real, is a real problem. I think a couple of things um, that I've been thinking about. So um, in my last job, I was able to travel to um, Montgomery, Alabama um, to visit the Equal Justice Initiative um, Legacy Museum and Memorial. Um, and for me, I think that um, the uh, understanding, as you said, of how long um, the fight for civil rights, especially for people of color, has been going on, um, may, has made a deep impact on me. I, you know, like the in the 50s and 60s, people were doing incredible work um, that was highly visible, and it was, you know, the result of tons of organizing and people coming together, um, and. That wasn't the beginning, and I think this is what we we often um, learn in um, in school is that like the Voting Rights Act was passed, or you know they succeeded, and now it's every and, and we're all fine. And I think it's an important part to be talking about is the fight is still going. Um, people of color in this country um, are still experiencing systemic racism um, from all kinds um, of levels of government. Um, including voting suppression, which is a, you know, a very important part of the work that we do. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think that's, that's one thing that, um, that I've been thinking about um, as well. Um, and I think the other thing is that as an organization that, um, that does or community organizing that really tries to build relationships and have um, grassroots um, projects is that, you know, the, the most prominent parts of the civil rights movement were things like um, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. speaking on the, uh, 
um, on the, you know, near the Washington Monument on the mall and giving this beautiful speech. But that and that and it was beautiful and it was amazing, but that is only part of the story. Um, and I think about the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, Rosa Parks sat down that day, but she sat down after months and months and months of work that a lot of women did um, and were not acknowledged for. And that organizing took an, an incredible amount of work to get to the point where Rosa Parks was able to sit on that bus and have the effect that she did. Um, so for me, what I when I think about one of the things I think about in the civil rights movement is all of these unnamed folks who did so much work to make these moments that seem, you know, that a lot of times we learn are spontaneous or just like, it, that was the thing that happened that moved everyone when you, when I know as an organizer, it, it takes so much work behind the scenes um, to have um, a lasting impact. Um, and then also just, you know, the Montgomery bus boycott went on for ages. Um, it was such a long time. And I think, um, especially now, um, when things are really tough, I think, for folks who believe in peace and justice, um, to remember that, like, this is a long fight. Um, and as um, Dr. King made famous the phrase, um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think it's, right now, I think we're feeling more than ever how long it is. If you live in North Carolina, um, you may live um, near one of our chapters, which we have in Durham, Orange County, in Wake County, um, in Charlotte, and then in the West. Um, and we're we are um, having we're starting a chapter um, in the Greensboro Triad area. Um, so get in touch with us if you live in one of those areas. And if you don't live in one of those areas, still get in touch with us. Um, since we do have so much going on online right now, um, there are different ways to engage. Um, and we have different um, working groups and issue areas that we work on. Um, and we would love to just get to know you um, and start building a relationship, um, you know, looking towards a time when we can all gather together and when we have sort of a, a clearer idea. This is a time of a lot of uncertainty right now. Um, and so I think that um, Jews having, uh, having community with other Jews who are interested in justice issues is so important. Um, even if we're not able to do all of the things that we wanna do right now, um, and the other thing I'll say is um, if you're outside of North Carolina, you can support us uh, financially with donations. And I, I just want to say something about that because I think a lot of times that um, giving money is derided as sort of low impact and shows, a, you know, a lack of uh, commitment or something, um, you know, I think you know, money is, a, is certainly a tough issue, um, especially in the Jewish community, but it has, there's a long tradition of us um, organizing our money to build community. One of the first things we did after the Exodus, um, you know, as, as newly freed slaves was to organize money to figure out how to build a, um, a community and a society and that is that is still true now that need to do that um, and especially at a time um, when income inequality is uh, is um, so stark um, right now the model is for um, people to, to give money um, as a way um, of uh, of sort of equaling the playing field of, of enacting justice um, it's not what I would like to see permanently, but right now that is what's happening. Um, and I also think that for some people, um, giving money can be a way of living out their values um, in the world. And um, you know, we, it takes um, a lot to be able to run an organization as anyone who has been a part of one knows. I think there's a real opportunity um, for Jews to make an impact um, on justice issues. By ourselves, we are tiny, um, even smaller proportion um, in the South than in other places in the country. But when we join together with other folks um, who are um, who are traditionally marginalized or are minorities, there's a lot of opportunity for us um, to. 
um, make, make a big impact. Now that we've learned about Southern civil rights organizing on the local and state level, let's talk about regional advocacy work. You've likely heard of the Southern Poverty Law Center, an organization that fights hate and injustice through the legal system across the South. The SPLC umbrella also includes Teaching Tolerance, an organization dedicated to providing social justice and anti-bias resources to educators across the country. And the Civil Rights Memorial, a contemplative monument and interpretive center in Montgomery, Alabama, that honors those who lost their lives in the struggle for justice. I spoke with Lindsay Rubenstein, a law fellow in the SPLC's Jackson, Mississippi office, about the SPLC's work. I asked her what the SPLC's litigation typically looks like and learned about how advocacy and community engagement play a role in the cases the SPLC brings to court. Lindsay also happens to be Jewish, so I asked her about how her Jewishness plays a role in her work for civil rights. Hi. My name is Lindsay Rubenstein. I'm a law fellow at the Southern Property Law Center. I'm based in Jackson, Mississippi, although I'm coming to you from my childhood home on Long Island. Um, and the Southern Property Law Center is a civil rights organization that was started in Montgomery, Alabama um, over 40 years ago. Um, it started as an organization that was aimed at um, basically stripping all the funds from the Ku Klux Klan and we have um, expanded in a lot of ways. Now we track hate groups across the country and we engage in litigation in various um, impact areas that we've isolated um, that work towards civil rights for all people in this country. I am a law fellow on the Children's Rights Practice Group. So that means that I work for the rights of children in Mississippi and across the Deep South. And so what that means for me is that I focus on mostly education equity, uh, the school to prison pipeline across the Deep South, and most importantly, and, and my, biggest, my biggest practice area has been uh, so far keeping public schools public. So that means keeping public money in public schools and fighting a privatization agenda um, for public schools so that all children have access to the same or, or equitable resources uh, throughout the Deep South. So in the Mississippi office uh, of SPLC, we have two functioning practice groups. So we have my practice group, the Children's Rights Practice Group, which does, as I said, education equity work, um, school to prison pipeline work, um, and uh, the fighting, fighting against school privatization. We also have a criminal justice reform practice group, um, and they work on behalf of the rights of incarcerated people throughout the state of Mississippi. Um, uh, helping, you know, improve their conditions while they're incarcerated, fighting against lengthy sentences, and um, a, a various other, you know, issues incarcerated people face in the state of Mississippi. Um, and then, uh, even though our office only has those two practice groups, we collaborate a lot with experts from uh, other offices throughout the organization. So, for example, right now, um, some people on the criminal justice reform practice group um, are collaborating with people in our voting rights practice group uh, to launch a case to um, help incarcerated people throughout the state vote and help other people throughout the state vote. Um, and then also as a subset of our criminal justice reform practice group, we have people working specifically on what's called our three strikes project. And that means that Mississippi, like many states, has a law that if a person is convicted three times of what's called a violent offense, which is a very, very loose term, and a lot of the time what we would imagine would be a violent offense under the law is not a violent offense as it would be in our imaginations, that person is now eligible to be sentenced to life without parole. So we have people throughout the state of Mississippi that are serving life without parole sentences for things like stealing, you know, a few basic goods from a grocery store or, you know, doing some other innocuous thing, but because they have two prior, what's called violent offenses, they're serving life sentences without the possibility of parole. And so we have a three strikes project that petitions uh, individually for those people's release when they fit the, under the meaning of the three strikes statute. And that's really the, the scope of the work that's being done in Mississippi. And, and we vouch off in certain places, like now we're getting into, you know, 
Confederate monuments and, and we're, we're also getting into a little bit of community organizing, which we've been doing for a long time, but, but those are our kind of two big um, focus areas. SPLC kind of uh, ex expanded, almost basically exploded after the 2016 election. We went from like 130 employees, to like over 400 employees in like less than six months. It was wild. So because of that rapid growth and, and trying to build the infrastructure to kind of support all of the people that were coming on, um, the work that was being done to kind of collaborate across uh, practices and projects and offices kind of fell by the wayside. So we're working now to rebuild that muscle. So um, practice groups will be working with teaching tolerance to like, okay, so for the children's rights practice group, we work a lot with teachers unions because uh, a lot of the time the teachers unions will be saying that the administration is wanting them to do something that they know is, you know, not good for the child or for the children that they see every day. So we work a lot with teachers unions. We have a very strong relationship with them. And because of that, also teaching tolerance has a really good relationship with the teachers unions as well. And, and teaching tolerance is basically helping people that are in the classroom every single day. And so that's one point of collaboration, but there are a million points of collaboration, not just with teaching tolerance, but with the intelligence project, which helps our LGBT and special uh, litigation practice group. Um, because that that practice group kind of focuses mostly on hate crimes and hate groups um, and, and the hate that people suffer based on their sexual orientation or their religion or their gender identity or their race. Um, those two groups work, you know, very closely on fighting the white, doing a lot of the white supremacist work that SPLC is known for. So we're kind of building that muscle back up to, to we have a lot of areas of expertise, but but they don't always talk to each other. And so we're building that back up. We have a civil rights memorial that's the museum that's based in Montgomery that has just, you know, all of the knowledge in the world about Deep South civil rights work. And um, a lot of the time when we give, when we give, when we start litigation, that narrative is really important because a lot of the time when you tell a story, you can tell a story of, a, of, a, of you know, a child of color being wrongfully expelled for, you know, uh, messing around with one of their friends outside school and not getting a fair trial. You could tell that story by itself and it's compelling because it's a 16 year old and because they aren't getting education anymore. But knowing the full history of civil rights in Mississippi and how um, people of color kind of were forced out of the public education system and then when they were forced into the public, public education system, the state allowed it to crumble. Telling that story with a larger narrative is much more compelling. So we, so we, we're trying um, across the department and across the organization to kind of build up this muscle. And that's also to say, you know, we have a very strong communications team that, um, you know, tells about our work to the rest of the world. We have a very strong digital and design team. Um, so we're kind of like I said, as we take on new teams and as we take on new data analysts and things like that, researchers, um, we just get, you know, stronger and stronger. Our litigation gets stronger, our advocacy gets stronger. Oh, I should say that our advocacy and our um, outreach and organizing, that's built into the legal department. So a lot of the time we'll want to accomplish a goal, but litigation is really expensive and it also takes a long time and also a lot as you might imagine a lot of the judges that we work with aren't necessarily friendly to the southern poverty law center and so a lot of the time community members come with us with things they want to come to us with things they want to accomplish and we say okay well litigation is one option but the other option is just getting a hundred of you to call the principal or the superintendent or whoever we have to call and say you know what i'm i'm really not okay with this and and kind of get everybody in a room to have a listening session and to kind of mediate what the two sides want. So a lot of the time, even though our advocacy and outreach department is built into legal, our strategies aren't legal um, in the way that a lot of people think of it as. It could look like a lot of different things. Um, I'd say probably the most common type of case that we bring is because we see a state or the federal government or you know some kind of political entity do something that results in discrimination for a certain group of people 
So the way that that goes is when something like that happens, um, we, we, our community partners are incredibly important to us. And so we start reaching out to community partners and saying, hey, do you know somebody who might know somebody who might know somebody and on and on and on until we find someone that's affected by the rule and that's impacted by the rule and whose rights are curbed because of the rule. And we talk to them and, and, and in the best case scenario, we'll find lots of these people and we'll talk to all of them and we'll get their stories will get their consent to be part of a lawsuit, and then we kind of build their stories and their narratives into a complaint around why this is actually illegal. So that's one way of bringing litigation. That's the way that we bring litigation. Like we have lots of prison conditions cases across the across the Deep South. We have one in Angola and Louisiana. We have one in Parchman here. We have uh, one in the Alabama Department of Corrections. Um, for these major state penitentiaries, and usually we'll find people who are incarcerated who satisfy the criteria criteria for what we're trying to, to accomplish. Another way that we might we might uh, engage in litigation would be if a community partner comes to us and says, "I know somebody," or a community member comes to us themselves and says, "Something is happening in my community that I think is illegal." A lot of the time, that's better suited for. So SPLC does all of their work pro bono. We don't take um, money from any of our clients. So a lot of the time when people come to us with those concerns, they'll be better suited for an attorney who does kind of these smaller, you know, individual level cases that, that aren't really to challenge a policy, just to get these, this person's rights who, who are rightfully violated restored. But sometimes they'll bring it, they'll bring a case to us or they'll bring an issue to us and they'll say, this is probably having such a big impact that um, it's probably, you know, somebody, something that SPLC, you know, with its resources and with its name recognition um, should step in and try and kind of figure out what can be done here. So we'll do legal research on their case, we'll decide if it's strong, we'll decide where we should bring the lawsuit, and then we'll proceed from there. And so those are the two probably biggest ways that litigation, you know, comes out of our shop. I think that what SPLC tries to accomplish when it says things like, um, you know, the march continues when it, when it preserves all of this history, it's really saying, you know, the civil rights movement, first of all, isn't just our own. Second of all, doesn't just exist in this time and place, but is part of a larger, not only not only American, but kind of global push for rights and equity for all people. It's born out of you know this much deeper um, tension between hate and you know freedom, and so I think that when SPLC kind of tries to keep the past. Um, in our minds, but kind of not keep it alive. Um, what we're trying to do is kind of balance the tension between not thinking that we're walking into a movement or we're leading a movement even, because of course we're not, um, that's, you know, just beginning or that's new or that's reinvigorated, but to know that it's always been going on and that it always probably, you know, will be. So SPLC started a voting rights practice group back in February 2019. So we're relatively new, but we've been doing um, voter registration work, especially for incarcerated people, for a very long time. But now we have a practice group that's devoted to litigation on it. Um, so as you can imagine, the voting rights practice group is kind of swamped uh, in these last several months. They've been doing state-specific work throughout all of the states that we operated in, operate in. So that's Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. Um, but they also consult on, on, on work across the country that people are doing, and they have good relationships with voting rights experts and voting rights lawyers and voting rights thinkers throughout the country as well. Um, but they're kind of our, you know, resident experts on voting rights. And so in Mississippi, this election cycle, one of the things that they're working on, we just filed a case um, in Mississippi that we're waiting, I think that we filed um, a motion for what's called a preliminary injunction. So that means to stop, that means that when you file that, you're asking the court to tell the state to stop whatever it's doing until the lawsuit is either won or lost. 
Um, so in the Mississippi case, one of the things that we're challenging is obviously because not only is there an election coming up, but we're also in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, lots of people are shifting from in-person voting to absentee voting. And there are several reasons given in the state of Mississippi in which one might um, apply for and receive an absentee vote, one of them being that you're out of state like me. And so when a person receives an absentee vote, even if they're in the state of Mississippi but can't go to vote for specific health reasons or because they live with a family member who is immunocompromised, that person needs to fill out an application and a ballot, and then they have to have the ballot witnessed by another person. And then the other thing about that is that you have to get your ballot notarized. And so we're challenging the notarization requirement because as you can imagine, um, people who live in rural parts of Mississippi who aren't traveling because of health concerns are going to have trouble, especially elderly people are going to have trouble finding notary publics and, and getting their ballot notarized and then sending it back to the state before um, election day. So that's the that's the work that we're doing in, in Mississippi right now, but we've also been working on you know voting rights efforts for years, whether it's mailing out sample ballots to people to know exactly what it looks like so that they know exactly you know what to fill out on the day of the election, or whether it's you know doing pushes for people to register to vote. Uh, SPLC has been involved in in voting rights in Mississippi for quite some time, but that's what our litigation looks like currently. My daily Jewish practice is not as important to my civil rights lens as my like long, long, long gen generational history of like struggling and surviving and struggling and surviving and struggling and surviving. And I didn't have that kind of historical perspective. Of course I did. Of course I could talk about the Holocaust when I was 16 and 17 and when I was younger, but now I kind of see Jews as people who are in constant, you know, like this, like circular motion in the same way that I think that a lot of civil rights movements are in constant perpetual circular motion. Um, one of the things that was important to me, uh, both as a Jewish person and as a person in civil rights, was that there was all there was all we were always pushed to you know like kind of ask more you know the very classic trope the Jews you know just ask and ask and ask and ask and I think that that's really important as far as you know civil rights workers and, and movement workers too that like just to never be satisfied with what there is because what we have is not as beautiful as it could be. And just to keep pushing for what we see to be as beautiful as what we know. And so that I think is the most Jewish thing about my civil rights work. I would first, if people wanna know more about, not about SPLC specifically, but how to internalize um, within themselves and within their families, how to live the principles that we espouse. I would recommend first going to Teaching Tolerance, it's called teachingtolerance.org, that's their website. But then if they wanna learn more about SPLC and the civil rights work that we do, they could go to splcenter.org, they could read about, we have an active docket on that website, we have um, our history, we have a civil rights history, we have a history of our founders, we have resources to the Civil Rights Memorial Center, and we have information about white supremacy, and we have information about, you know, this lost cause narrative of the Confederacy that's being espoused, and has been espoused by the sons and daughters of the Confederacy, which is, you know, that it's a tragedy that the South lost the Civil War, and this whole kind of spin. We have this whole kind of historical lens of the past and present, to the extent that those words are actually descriptive and mean anything, the past and present civil rights movements on our organization's website. And we also have a donate button if you are inspired by our work um, that you could give to us um, and we can keep pushing for the rights that we um, so desperately seek to see. There's always more that you could be doing. And it is not to say that we need to wake up every day and shame ourselves for what we didn't do yesterday, but it is to say that um, you know our work is never done and if today is the day that you that you do something as simple as go to your school board meeting or go to your city council meeting 
um, and get involved in your community because you want people who are like you and unlike you to have the privileges that you enjoy. Um, today is a good, as good a day as any. And uh, I appreciate, I appreciate you listening to this conversation and I, I hope that you will actively seek out more. Now I know you're wondering, if I'm a fan of the ISJL and I want to be involved in social justice work in my community, where do those two things intersect? I'll tell you. It's the ISJL's Community Engagement Department. I spoke with Rachel Glazer, the Community Engagement Program Manager, about the department's work on literacy, peer mediation, and Jewish social justice. Hi, my name is Rachel Glazer and I am the Community Engagement Program Manager at the ISJL. The Community Engagement Department does a whole lot of really cool work, all focused on social justice. Um, we love, love, love the phrase from Deuteronomy, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, justice, justice shall you pursue. We try to uh, infuse that into all of the work that we do. So on, on one hand, we have our secular work. We have lots of literacy initiatives, as well as a conflict resolution program that we run in communities, um, non-Jewish communities in the South. And on the other hand, we have our Jewish work, our ASK program. ASK stands for Act, Share, and Keep. And those are three ways that we've identified that Jewish communities can uh, engage with social justice, even if they don't feel like they are the right person to be engaging in these conversations, or if it's new for them, or if they feel like they've done it all and they need a new way to look at it. We try to engage as many different people across ages and entry points as possible. The ASK program is really beautiful and really exciting to me personally because I think that Jewish social justice shouldn't just be on a mitzvah day. It's a part of our everyday lives. It should be a part of our practice both in the synagogue and in the wider community. So the reason we have our three pillars, act, share, and keep, is because not everybody's going to engage with social justice in the same way. ACT uh, is more action focused. So we give folks ideas of how they can get out there, um, give them tools and tasks that they can actively do or that they can brainstorm for meaningful long-term service opportunities and not just one-off projects, all rooted in Jewish text and Jewish ritual and practice. SHARE is more dialogue focused. Um, we invite people to break bread. This is a great category if you um, are looking to do interfaith programming in your community. This is also a great one if you're looking to cost share with other Jewish communities and hear the kinds of projects as well as the kinds of issues that other communities are facing and, uh, and brainstorm that together. And then KEEP focuses on Jewish ritual. We're told to keep and remember the Sabbath. And I also like to hold that close to keep and remember that Jewish faith and Jewish tradition is deeply rooted in justice and we can, in justice, not in justice, and we can find um, lots of beauty and meaning in our work through our Jewish practice. Since uh, COVID-19 started, we have of course switched to virtual programming and several of our modules have worked really well in that new format. Uh, we shortened them down a little bit so they're 60 minutes long. And in particular, one that stands out to me is called Prayers and Playlists. And it looks at how we can use music to guide and drive us in our social action work. Uh, this is a one that I've run several times with B'nai Mitzvah groups. And um, so our seventh, sixth and seventh graders who are about to become Bar Bat Mitzvahs. And what we do is we, we talk about different music that has been either music of prayer or protest. We talk about both secular and religious music that can um, drive us and help us pick up that torch and carry it on. And then everybody chooses a, a social justice issue or topic and they create their own call to action playlist that they can use to motivate themselves when they're out praying with their feet. Being from Georgia, I'm very familiar with the story of Leo Frank, who the play Parade is based on. And I had the opportunity when I worked at URJ Camp Coleman to bring my 10th grade campers to the synagogue that uh, is in Marietta, Georgia, um, that is still to this day working on a lot of social justice issues to try and uh, overcome that really terrible legacy of this Jewish man who was lynched um, and was accused of uh, killing a young white woman. Um, this is back in the early 20th century. And so for me, it hits home for a lot of reasons. You have the persecution of a Jewish person, anti-Semitism um, that is very closely tied with anti-Black racism uh, in my home state. 
And so um, a lot of the work that that synagogue does now is, is much broader and, and, and broad, not, not meaning that it's not deep as well, but they have also worked with the LGBTQ plus community um, and, and I believe lots of other communities in Georgia who still to this day um, are struggling to, to uh, obtain the rights that we all love and know and deserve. Um, so working with Rabbi Steve Lebo, who actually now is the rabbi of my home congregation in North Georgia, uh, was really exciting, even if it was just for a quick afternoon. Um, I think trips like that were really meaningful for me as I was forming my Jewish identity. And Nora, I know the kinds of trips that you lead are very similar to that and, and much in line and have that same sort of power for the people who go on them. So hope that everybody will go on your trips and they will come back and continue that work with programs like mine. Um, being somebody who grew up in a very small Southern Jewish congregation in North Georgia, hello, Shalom Baharim, I miss y'all. Um, it, it became very clear to me early on that I had to choose Judaism. It was never going to be easy for me. And so for me to choose to go to Friday night services once a month with my family when we were able to have them in the Presbyterian church that we rented <laughs> that was 30 minutes away from our house, that was a very intentional choice for us as a family. Um, and I came to know social justice as being the same thing. So just because I have access to a lot of privilege and a lot of um, rights that other folks in my communities might not, doesn't mean I can get comfortable with that and that I shouldn't be choosing justice constantly. So for me, Judaism and justice are inextricably tied. Um, I, I love that the, the prayers that we say every day, and especially on this time of year, the high holidays, um, remind us that we have we always have the chance to do better um, and that it's not just on us it's on us as a community um, one of the things I especially love about Judaism is that we're not really encouraged to pray alone we're encouraged to pray together and I think justice work should be the same way um, you are not obligated to complete the work but neither are you free to desist from it it's upon all of us uh, to work for a better world even if we don't necessarily know that we'll get to see that world in our lifetime In addition to our Jewish programming, like I said earlier, we have several secular programs that we run. So if your community is looking for meaningful long-term service that you can do in partnership with your neighbors, reach out to me, let me know. Um, we have some wonderful literacy programs that have been operating really beautifully in the virtual world. One is Our Reading Family, which is a multi-generational literacy program where we invite parents and kids to grow their love of literacy together. And that meets for about 90 minutes once a week. It's a really doable program. I'd be happy to train you and other members of your community to run that awesome program. Uh, and with our other secular umbrella, Conflict Resolution, uh, we have this really awesome uh, opportunity from the Zadok family who have endowed us for a mentorship program with TAP, which stands for Talk About the Problems. So we're bringing in mentors from the community who use peer mediation and conflict resolution skills to come and work with middle school and high school students who are interested in fields like law, education, counseling, poli-sci, all sorts of fields that use conflict resolution. So if that sounds interesting to you, let me know. If folks are interested in bringing an ask module to your community virtually, you can reach out to me, Rachel Glazer, at rglazer at isjl.org. You can also check out our page on the ISJL website. And while you're there, you might see a little yellow donate button. Feel free to hit that and support the work of the ISJL across all of our wonderful departments. I love hearing about the work that these incredible people are doing. And I want to thank all of them so much for generously giving their time to share their wisdom with us. I hope you leave this session inspired as I am to find opportunities to advance racial justice in your community and in our nation. As Lindsay said to us, now is as good a day as any to do something to make our country a better place for everyone. The next session of the ISGL virtual vacation is a continuation of this civil rights thread. We're keeping it local once again with a conversation about the civil rights movement in Mississippi. In many ways, Mississippi is the heart of the movement, and there is so much amazing interpretation of that history across our state. 
We'll hear from my colleagues at Jackson State University and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we'll meet some key figures in the history of the struggle for Black civil rights here in Mississippi. We'll also learn about how Jewish leaders and activists like Rabbi Perry Nussbaum, Rabbi Charles Mantenband, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and many others fought for racial justice in this state. I'm so excited for you to join us. That session is on Tuesday, October 20th at 11 a.m. right here on the ISJL Facebook page. You can learn more about the ISJL virtual vacation, sign up for email updates, and watch all of our past sessions on our website. If you're not getting our emails, you really should. You'll get a detailed introduction to each week's session, a recap of the previous session, and lots of resources to explore these stories in more detail. Last week's email featured a playlist of songs by performers who appeared at the Stars for Freedom rally at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965. So if you want to be a part of the exclusive group receiving these emails, or if you want to read any of our past emails, please check out the ISJL Virtual Vacation website. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next week, same time, same place, to learn about the movement in Mississippi.